Our next speaker is the Interim State Director, California, of the Drug Policy Alliance, the nation's leading organization working to end the war on drugs, where she campaigns for cutting edge, um, cutting edge harm reduction policies and state legislation. Please welcome to the stage, Laura Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Am I on? Yes. Awesome. Um, so I am uh, really excited to get to do this talk. I was supposed to be here last year, and that didn't work out for a bunch of reasons. We can, you know, blame the president, among other people. Um, uh, but I've been uh, hearing about Skepticon for years, from particularly from uh, Greta, Christina, and Ingrid Nelson, who've been like, you know, trying to get me here. So I'm really excited to be here. I am also, um, I am a person who owns an inflatable T-Rex suit. And as a person who owns an inflatable T-Rex suit, I really felt like there was no way that I could pass up a conference that had a T-Rex as its logo. So, um, uh, with all that, so um, minor content note, I do have um, images of syringes uh, in this, if that's something that um, squeaks you out, just uh, to be aware of that. Um, but I am, um, so uh, a little bit about me and the organization where I work. Um, I uh, live in San Francisco. I've been there for about 30 years. My background, uh, if you came to the AIDS activist workshop yesterday, you heard a little bit about my background in HIV. I'm a queer, atheist, poly, femme, San Franciscan um, who's lived there <laughs> for a long time. And um, the organization that I work for is the Drug Policy Alliance, and it's a national nonprofit organization trying to end the war on drugs. And what we mean by that is we work in a number of different areas, uh, criminal justice and sentencing reform, harm reduction, public health, access to treatment, um, and legalizing marijuana. Uh, and I'll come back to some of that in the end. I also want to say in the context of this talk, I am a person who uses drugs. Um, exactly. So, what do I, well, what do I mean by that, right? What is a drug? Um, I'm going to start there. And, uh, it, you know, we've got some sort of basic definitions of what is a drug, that it's a chemical that affects how your body feels or works. And that's a very broad definition. And when we talk about you know, drug policy reform or drug prohibition, we're usually not talking about uh, things like sugar. Um, but the reality is, when it comes to things that change our perceptions of the world, change how our body works, change how our body feels, um, that covers everything from prescribed pharmaceuticals, aspirin, Tylenol, um, caffeine, the coffee cups that many people have been clutching this morning after a late night last night, as well as alcohol, tobacco, and then what the, the illicit or illegal drugs that are what we start to think of um, when we start thinking about drugs and when we start talking about who is a drug user, who uses drugs. Um, that's really what we're, we're starting to talk about. And, um, and I'm going to get into this a bit more, but uh, you know, some of these are legal, some of them aren't. There are specific reasons why some of them are legal and some of them aren't. Some of them are legal in some forms and not legal in others. Uh, but when we look at this issue of what is a drug and how I'm talking about it here, it really is the sort of caffeine to cocaine, um, to name two of America's favorite stimulants, uh, sort of, of sweep. Um, and so then, using that definition, like, who uses drugs? Um, uh, I mean, I say I'm a person who uses drugs, and that's true. Um, I use legal substances. I have, in my life, used illegal substances. Um, but the bottom line is really that essentially all of us are people who use drugs in one form or another. When it comes to um, the illicit drugs, um, 
uh, nearly half of Americans over the age of 12 have used an illicit drug, um, the vast, vast majority of that being uh, marijuana or cannabis. But when you start to add in alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, um, nearly all of us are people who have at one point or another put a substance into our body that changed how, how we felt or how our body worked. Um, except then this goes away. Um, and so with that context that we are all people who use drugs, why then are some people, like why do we use words like junkie or druggy or crackhead? Um, why do we put some people who use drugs in one category and other people who use drugs in a different category? And a lot of that has to come to, comes down to um, you know, the, a need to differentiate ourselves, to say my drug use is okay, it's sanctioned, it's legal, it's functional, it's good for me. Um, that person's drug use is not functional, it's not good for them, it's bad for them. Um, and then we start assigning sort of othering words to people. Um, if, if nothing else uh, today, maybe I can convince you to, to not use the word addict to describe people. I mean, I know there's a lot of focus on people first language, so um, a person who uses drugs, person who has a problematic relationship with drugs, um, uh, the extent to which we cannot label people as their condition, behavior, disease, etc. cetera. Um, so the word addict gets thrown around a lot to describe people. Um, it's something that we, uh, that from in my line of work, it's a, it's a label um, and a word that increases stigma, that increases identifying an individual with what they are doing instead of who they are and all of their humanity. And so trying to move away from using uh, addict as much as possible. Um, but why, why do people use drugs? People use drugs because they feel good. Um, people use drugs because they take away pain. People use drugs because they help us function in our lives. Um, people use drugs because, um, you know, we might die if we don't take them. They keep us alive. Uh, and that is no different um, for most people who are using illicit drugs. So that people who have uh, started out um, using illicit substances, whether that's marijuana or heroin, have generally started uh, because it feels good, um, because they are curious about it, because they're interested in it. And for some of us, it becomes something that helps us navigate life. It helps us get through the day. It takes away um, pain and uh, trauma um, and uh, enables us to sort of move through the world um, and survive it, which is, um, and I'm not trying to say here that drug use is fine and that everyone should use drugs. I'm just saying have some understanding about why people use drugs. I also want to fully acknowledge that um, people who are who have a problematic relationship to drugs, um, what we would generally call addiction, can be really it's it's devastating, harmful awful um, when those are people in your family and you're watching them go through it. And I don't in any way want to minimize sort of the very real um, difficulties that people go through or imply in any way that it's necessarily easy to get out of problematic substance use. Um, it, and, but when we talk about sort of what is addiction or what is problematic substance use, the, the Definition, um, and you're going to get definitions. This is, to some extent, a very contested area of science right now, and there are lots of debates about this. But what is addiction or problematic uh, drug use? And it's generally defined as compulsive use despite negative consequences. Um, and the National Institutes of Drug Abuse will add in that it is a brain disease. It is a brain disease with um, where people... Uh, continue to compulsively use, crave the drug, use the drug, despite negative consequences. 
And usually those negative consequences are seen as things like um, losing your job, going to jail, uh, um, family problems, um, losing friendships, relationships, all of that. And um, so in in 1974, a sociologist named Lee Robbins um, got interested in something that was going on um, with Vietnam vets. And her work really changed what we, how we think of addiction and problematic substance use. And um, at the time, about 20% of the um, American um, military folks in Vietnam had developed problematic heroin use. And yet what she discovered was when they returned to the US, the vast majority of them stopped using heroin pretty much immediately and never went back to using heroin again. Um, only 7% of them ever used heroin in the US, and of those, only 1% to 2% uh, ever actually stayed in a cycle of um, heroin dependence, heroin addiction. And that led people to sort of rethink some of what they thought about addiction and what causes it, and also what enables people to get out of it. And there's, there's no drug that is instantly and immediately addictive. That's one of the, the various myths that you hear a lot from the media is, oh, if you try meth once, you're going to end up you know, lying in a gutter with no teeth, right? And the reality is a lot more complex than that in terms of who develops problems and why. So this, um, this chart up here, so the chart on the left is the percentage of people who started using a drug the year before last, but aren't using it this year. So 75% of the people who, in this chart, used crack last year are not using it now, right? And yet crack is one of those ones that we're told, like, oh, it, crack is immediately addictive. Um, and uh, heroin, 70% uh, of the people who tried it last year are not using it this year. Um, and then the figure on the other side, the percentages of people who uh, started using it last year who are now um, physically dependent on it, addicted to it. And heroin, here it is the highest at 13%. So 13% of the people who tried it last year are now in a position of being dependent on it, which is bad, that is not good. <laughs> but what that means is that the rest of those folks did not develop a dependence on heroin, even though they tried it. And with crack, it's 9%. Um, so on average, it's about 10% of people who try a substance will develop a problem related to that, will develop addiction. Um, uh, the percentages are um, uh, higher for alcohol, um, highest, in fact, for tobacco. Um, but you know, when it comes to the the harm that a drug uh, does, um, it's not necessarily it doesn't necessarily track with what you might hear in the media or what our sort of um, popular conception of it is. And so I said that there's some you know there's some debate about. Um, uh, the, the nature of addiction and whether it's a brain disease or not. This is, you know, this is your brain on drugs, like America's most famous drug education advertisement ever, right? How many of you have seen this? Or, yeah, exactly. Um, so we talk about addiction as a brain disease. That's what the official US government stance is on this. That's what the National Institutes of Drug Abuse says. Um, they do a lot of uh, brain screens, MRIs, things like that, uh, to see what happens in people's brains while they're using drugs. But a growing body of knowledge, you know, again, going back to this study with Vietnam vets in the 1970s, is saying it's not really as simple as that. It's not as much about a chemical and your brain as it is about a lot of the other stuff and the context in which we live. 
So um, it, there's it, you know a number of different sort of theories around um, describing addiction or describing problematic drug use as um, as a sort of a choice issue, as a learning disorder. Um, uh, Maya Solovitz is uh, easily one of my favorite authors writing on um, drugs and drug use for a lay audience, and she wrote recently a book called Unbroken Brain, which I highly recommend. Um, and she talks about addiction as a learning disorder in which not a learning disorder um, like a developmental, well, it is sort of a developmental issue, but that the ways in which we are wired as humans to survive, to succeed, to love, get, um, they, they get out of whack and attach themselves to drugs instead of other things. And what our body learns and our brain learns is that drugs will provide the kinds of um, uh, sort of neurological inputs that we would otherwise be getting from what we do in our life. So if you think about that, you know, um, persisting to use drugs in the face of negative consequences, persisting, keeping going, continuing to do this, even in the face of negative consequences, that's something that as a human species is actually part of what enables us to say, be parents, right? Like you keep going, you keep going, you wake up every night, the baby's crying, like you just, you keep going and we're wired to persist. Um, it's what makes for great, you know, great artists and great scientists who are keep persisting and persisting in the face of a lot of negative consequences and, um, personal issues, and so it's that same wiring that has enabled our species to survive that then gets misapplied or misattached. And the things that we know that make people really vulnerable to problematic substance use, um, and it's not, you know, they, you can hear this like addiction doesn't discriminate or drug use doesn't discriminate, and uh, you know, I mean that's sort of true on the surface, but the reality is that the context in which we live, the context in which we we grow up has a huge amount to do with what makes us vulnerable to developing problematic substance use. In fact, the single largest predictor of whether or not someone as an adult will develop a substance use disorder is the number of adverse childhood events that they experienced as a child. And so while it's certainly not, it's never 100%, like if you um, have adverse childhood experiences, you will uh, definitively develop a substance use disorder. It's not like that at all, but it's, it is a marker of things that make us more vulnerable. Um, whether that was, you know, childhood physical trauma, emotional trauma, um, abuse, uh, and it can include economic deprivation, um, the things that leave us vulnerable to a lot of stuff. The links are actually stronger between adverse childhood uh, events and a later problematic substance use disorder than they are between obesity and um, cardiac problems. So we all, we all think that we know that one. This one is an even stronger link. These are parts of the things that, um, that make us vulnerable to substance use. And they're parts of, those are things that can be fixed but that involves things like, you know, making sure that parents have the economic well-being to provide care for their children, early childhood education, um, you know, free child care for working parents, things like that. Those are not things that we usually think of as substance use prevention, but those are probably the things that we need to invest in um, for their own sake, but also that's going to be the way that we prevent this. There's been a lot of, um, you may have seen this going around on Facebook or, or something, but the opposite of addiction is not abstinence, it's connection, right? And that fits into this same theory that what people are looking for is connection. We're wired for that as humans. That wiring goes out of whack and attaches itself um, to drugs. So, um, So that's kind of how people get into problematic use. How do people get out of problematic use? And does anyone know what this is a photo of? Um, this is an experiment called Rat Park. 
uh, done by a researcher named Bruce Alexander in Canada. And he was, um, he was a, you know, um, addiction researcher uh, looking at, you know, rats and rats compulsive use of drugs. And it occurred to him that, you know, they were doing all of this. It was like these ones where like rats would keep pushing the lever to get the drug until they died sort of thing. And this was one of the ways that they were proving that, you know, that heroin was addictive because rats would keep pushing the lever to get more of the drug. Um, and he realized that they were keeping the rats in these, you know, like small sterile wire cages, unable to interact with each other, and that they were in this very isolated, um, sort of horrible place to be. And he thought, what happens if we actually make a place where the rats are, you know, rats are social animals. If they're able to socialize with other rats, if they're able to run around, if they've got interesting things to interact with in their environment. And so he and his colleagues built Rat Park, where again, they had the same levers that rats could push to get the drug, but what they found was almost immediately um, the rats stopped focusing on the lever for the drug because they were in a place where they could socialize with other rats, where they could um, find other sorts of uh, um, stimulation, things to do, um, uh, you know, other food to eat, etc. And again, this is one of the sort of formative experiences, or, um, experiments in the world of uh, drug use research that points to what it is is, a, is not about the drug per se as much as it is about the context and the set and setting. So drug set and setting um, is a sort of core principle of harm reduction, that these are the things to take into account. This is what determines your experience on drugs, the drug itself. Um, your mindset, your mental health status, uh, sort of what's going on with you, and then the setting, the context in which you're doing it um, as a core part of that. And what we also know um, is that most people, so most people who use a drug don't develop a problem. Of the people who do develop a problem, most of them find their way out without ever engaging in any sort of professional or clinical assistance. Many people just just age out of it. Um, you know, the, the a sort of common example of this is someone who develops a really severe drinking problem while they're in college, right? Binge drinking every weekend, really over consuming, um, you know, potentially putting their lives or other people's lives in danger. Graduates from college, moves out, gets a job, et cetera, and their alcohol use drops off dramatically. They may still drink from time to time, but they're not engaging in that problematic use despite negative consequences like hangovers and being late to class and grades and things like that. And that, in fact, is true for most drugs, that most people age out of it. Um, and there's, uh, and of the people who don't find their way out of it, um, on their own, uh, the ones who do want treatment need to access treatment, and again, this is part of the failure of the U.S. system, only about 10% of the people who want treatment are in treatment right now. There's no other health condition where we tolerate that kind of lack of capacity. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot in my job is this, we have to force people into treatment. If drugs aren't illegal, how will we ever get people into treatment? And the reality is almost every treatment program in this country has a waiting list, right? Methadone clinics have waiting lists. Residential treatment programs have waiting lists. Um, therapists have waiting lists or, you know, people who would like to access them if they could get their insurance to pay for it. Right, and that's part of what keeps people out of treatment is that their insurance isn't paying for it or isn't paying for the right kind of treatment, the treatment that they need and would match what they do. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the other sort of myths that 
uh, in addition to this, like, we need to have a hammer to hit people over the head in order to force them into treatment, one of the other myths is the myth of the bottom. Like, you have to hit bottom. This is a core uh, part of the 12-step um, Alcoholics Anonymous sort of belief system. And I, I want to say, like, I have people in my life whose lives have been saved by 12-step groups and by AA um, it certainly it, and absolutely definitely works for some people, but it's also one of these places that's got this sort of circular logic of if this didn't work for you, the problem is you, right? You didn't work it hard enough, which is not a good way to run what's essentially a social support group, right? AA just doesn't work for some people, and that doesn't mean that they are failures. It means that that's not the right um, type of program for them. I also don't believe that 12-step is treatment. I think it's a social support group. I think social, you know, I've just been talking about connection. That's a great place for people to find connection and find commonality and find the kinds of support that they want, but that's not the same thing as, uh, as treatment. Um, and so the, this myth of the bottom, that you have to hit bottom, is a very dangerous one because it often encourages us to allow loved ones in our life or people we know who are having problems with substance use to, uh, to get worse. And the reality is people recover better when they have more support around them and allowing people to get worse and worse and worse and suffer more and more negative consequences from their drug use, especially if that means things like losing their home, losing their job, um, losing their insurance. Those are things that are going to make it harder for them to recover and not easier. We don't need to let people hit some sort of bottom, which is, again, it's this sort of fallacy of, you know, the bottoms wherever you find it sort of thing. Like, you'll hear like, oh, people just didn't hit bottom, they need to hit bottom or something. And it's this kind of imagined worst case scenario uh, that there's no, we shouldn't be wishing people off to some even worst case scenario before we think that they're ready to come back. Um, So, oops, there we go. Um, so now I'm going to get into a bit about sort of why some drugs are legal and why some drugs aren't legal. Are there any chemistry folks in the room? Anyone know what either of these two molecules is? Um, all right, so which one of these do you think is legal and which one is not? They look pretty similar, right? So one of these is heroin and one of these is Dilaudid. Dilaudid is a pharmaceutical product. Heroin was once a pharmaceutical product. It was created by Bayer, right, um, but is not, uh, not legal now. So there's, you know, and, and this is, a, this is a, a joke. I mean, I'm being a bit snarky about this. This is the same um, uh, sort of thing. One of these is sometimes legal and one of these is never legal. It's, you know, Adderall and uh, amphetamine. Um, and there's nothing about the chemical structure of the drugs that relates to why some drugs are legal and some drugs aren't. Um, and, you know, you probably know that many of the drugs that are now illegal were once legal, right? So this is, you know, advertisement for cocaine toothache drops, which I imagine that cocaine was actually extremely good at stopping toothaches. Um, it's a very good pain management tool and probably, I mean, it says instantaneous cure, you know, price 15 cents, who could argue with that? So, um, you know, all of the drugs that are now illegal, that are prohibited in the U.S., of course, they were at one point legal. Um, this is a, a photo of an opium den in San Francisco. So San Francisco was the first place in the United States to make the consumption of a drug illegal. Specifically, they made the smoking of opium illegal. They did this very explicitly, setting in place the um, overarching sort of frame of the war on drugs and drug prohibition in the United States, which we have exported to the rest of the world, sadly. Um, but they did it as a system of racial control. 
So they did not make illegal purchasing opium pills in a pharmacy, which is where many of the, say, upper middle class white women were purchasing their opium. They made illegal the smoking of it, which was what was being done by Chinese immigrants in Chinatown. And they were very explicit that this was one of the ways that they were going after the Chinese community. This was um, the 1870s. This was a time of great xenophobia, of great anxiety about immigrants around immigration, um, fear that Chinese immigrants were taking our jobs, right? There was also a significant fear that white women were going into opium dens and smoking up and possibly getting it on with the Chinese men in these opium dens. Um, so it fell within all of these frames around we want to control the Chinese community, we want to punish the Chinese community, we are afraid for the purity of our white women, um, and so we are going to ban this practice of theirs by banning the drug that they are consuming. So that's, that is the beginning, um, and that is where it has gone ever since. Essentially, every single drug that we have prohibited, um, that we have made illegal, has its bases in uh, white supremacy, in racism, um, and in a, in a desire to create systems of racial control that reinforce white supremacy. So, you know, Michelle Alexander wrote this great book, The New Jim Crow. Um, that's my second book plug of the, of the event. Um, if you haven't read, read The New Jim Crow, I highly recommend it. But going beyond the Chinese in San Francisco, so the anti-marijuana laws, in fact, the reason that we call it marijuana, um, marijuana is the Mexican slang. Lots of people already knew what cannabis was, and in fact, they were able to purchase cannabis in their pharmacy, but marijuana, using the Mexican slang term, um, made it sound foreign and scary and weird. And it was specifically directed again at uh, migrants, at migrant workers who were taking our jobs. And um, you know, it, given our current conception of you know, a stoner as someone who is lazy and unmotivated, the um, perception that was being put out around the Mexican migrants, they were um, smoking marijuana and became violent and aggressive. Right? And then this, you know, it's a little hard to hear. Negro cocaine fiends are a new southern menace. Murder and insanity increasing among lower class blacks because they have taken to sniffing since deprived of whiskey by prohibition. All right, so there's a lot going on in that headline. Um, this is the New York Times, um, our paper of record, right? And uh, again, you know, cocaine, heroin, it was usually targeting African Americans, um, uh, featuring all sorts of mythological stories, often about being superhuman, being able to withstand police bullets, um, and, uh, and again, um, you know, and people got more and more explicit about the fact that they were, uh, you know, going after this supposed um, uh, threat um, towards, again, towards the purity of white women. White women have a lot to, uh, to um, uh, reckon with uh, as an excuse for some of the worst harms of the war on drugs. Um, we can get into a, a whole peak white feminism conversation about that some other time. Um, and this got, uh, this got sort of more explicit uh, with Nixon and his war on drugs, um, where he declared, officially declared a war on drugs. That was the first time that that term really came to be used in 1971. Um, despite a, sh a commission report in 1972 that said that marijuana was actually fine and should be uh, legalized, but they ignored that, although a few states managed to decriminalize um, back then. Then, of course, this is Nancy Reagan and just say no. And this is where things amped up even more um, around the uh, crack cocaine epidemic. And again, this was... Um, 
dumped on the heads of um, the African American communities uh, as this is your problem. Um, this idea of super predators, for example. Um, I, there's a lot to go into here in this conversation about all of the ways in which uh, white supremacy and racism has played out around all of this. Um, I do recommend reading Michelle Alexander's book for a really clear um, sort of description of it. Um, and so what, so I don't mean to underplay that, but I'm not going deep into it, but I'm certainly happy to, uh, to either refer you to, re to resources or talk more about it. Um, but I'm gonna sort of take it for granted that we all think that racism is a bad thing here and that this is part of the problem. And I'm gonna talk through a little bit more of the details. So this is the um, number of people incarcerated for drug law violations starting in 1972, back when Nixon declared that war on drugs. But where you see it really amping up is in the 80s. And that's where these, the crack cocaine issues came through. One of the things that um, Congress did, and in its wisdom, was uh, they thought that and again, this goes to sort of who is associated with which drugs and how racism operates. So they certainly under, there was certainly plenty of cocaine being used in the 1980s. Um, and there was also crack being used. And the assumption was that crack was being primarily used by African Americans, primarily in urban centers. And as a consequence of this sort of moral panic, around race and crack cocaine, Congress created uh, sentencing penalties that were 100 times stiffer for crack than for cocaine. If you were gonna be facing a penalty of a year for a cocaine possession, if you had that same amount of crack, you would get a 100 years sentence, right? Which is essentially, people were getting sentenced to hundreds and hundreds of years. Some of those folks are still incarcerated today. It's not because they had more crack. And what's, what's the difference between crack and cocaine? Does anyone know? Baking soda, exactly, baking soda. Um, baking soda is exactly the difference, the chemical difference between cocaine and crack. You add baking soda, you process it, and you have crack. Um, and, uh, this is, you know, we lead the way, America number one, um, in incarceration. This is the world incarceration rate per 100,000 people. This is data from 2013, but it hasn't gotten any better. Um, we're out there ahead of Rwanda and Russia um, in our incarceration rate. We're way above China. Um, we're, yeah. We're doing better than Rwanda on incarcerating our people. And this is not because Americans are worse people. Um, this is not because we're generally more prone to crime. This is because we have a criminal justice system that selects certain people for certain characteristics and locks them up. Um, oops, I forgot that was there too basically showing our, again, our uh, prison population going up. Um, and most of the drug arrests, though, are for marijuana. Uh, so this is um, somewhat dated information from about five years ago, but nearly half of all drug arrests are marijuana. Uh, people get arrested for marijuana. People get uh, convicted for marijuana. Um, and then, so what happens, even if you're not stuck serving a 300 year sentence for crack, uh, we have significant consequences for a criminal conviction. We don't let people go when they're done. We don't say, okay, now you've served your time. You've you know, fulfilled your obligation in our social contract around what happens. We don't say, okay, now you've been rehabilitated or treated. We say, you're still a bad person. You're always gonna be a bad person. We're not gonna let you vote. We're not gonna let you get a job. We're not gonna allow you to live in public housing. We're not gonna allow your mom or your grandmother to live in public housing if you wanna visit her. 
Um, we're not going to let you have food stamps. We'll let people with other kinds of convictions have food stamps, but we're not going to let you have food stamps. Um, you're not going to be able to go back to school because you won't be able to get a student loan. And um, you also probably can't buy a gun. Um, and generally, we're just not going to make it very easy for you to get back to any kind of life that you had beforehand. And this goes against both the evidence and, in fact, the common sense. Like, if someone has done some time in prison, what we should want for them as a society is for them to integrate back into society as quickly as possible, to maintain the family connections. We don't want them to go back to jail. We don't want them to get arrested and convicted again. We want them to, you know, maybe we say we want them to have learned their lesson and now have a successful life. And in fact, many people certainly do that and are able to do that. But they do that despite our systems instead of because of it. I mean, the right to vote is one of those most basic of rights as an American citizen. And felony disenfranchisement is, among other things, it's one of the reasons why, you know, so many, I mean, it's, it is explicitly about disenfranchising the African American community. And it is a part of the voter suppression that's being leveraged in this country against communities of color. Um, and so it's, it's not at all an accident, it's not a mistake, it's very intentional using of the war on drugs as a way to further um, control the African American community in particular. Um, and so, you know, and child custody is another one uh, that's up here, um, which isn't even getting into what happens to pregnant women um, when they are accused of having used drugs. So, um, and again, here's just some of the, you know, we know that uh, people of color and white people use drugs at about the same rates. Um, but uh, even though whites and blacks and Latinos all use drugs at about the same rates, blacks and Latinos take, make up um, two thirds of the people incarcerated in state prison for that, uh, when it should be much smaller. Um, so where does that so where does that get us? That's a lot of problems, <laughs> uh, and so this is you know this is where groups like the drug policy organization, my organization, come in, and some of what we're trying to do is roll back some of that. And so and we have so the crack powder cocaine disparity went from 100 to one down to 18 to one. It's still not one to one. Um, uh, but it's going in the right direction. We have been able to legalize marijuana in a number of states, um, my state, California included. Uh, we've been able to push back on a lot of these sentencing uh, enhancements. Um, uh, and, you know, one of the things um, we've also been able to push for syringe access programs, um, various harm reduction approaches, uh, and so we've had a fair amount of success with all of that. But we're in the midst of a new drug panic and a new drug crisis uh, that you've probably heard about. Um, so this is the original, you know, heroin. Um, but the U.S. is in the middle of an opioid crisis uh, and an opioid overdose crisis. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what we've learned as we um, walk into this new crisis or, or have it come to us. How many people here have lost someone to a drug overdose? Yeah, it's, um, and, I, and I, you know, I find it, really horrifying what's happening in the U.S. right now. I mean, this is my job to pay attention to these numbers, and I find them so disturbing and upsetting, um, in part because many of us were saying, uh, you know, we were this Cassandras out there saying, you know, listen to us, listen to us, listen to us. What you're doing is going to cause more problems in the long run, and we weren't listened to, and the, the cost um, is people's lives. So this is a chart from the New York Times of uh, drug overdoses. In 2016, 
there are around 60,000 deaths in that year. That's higher than the, um, oops, sorry. Here we go. That's higher than peak gun deaths in a year in 1993, which is here. This is higher than the peak HIV AIDS deaths in 1995, which is here. Peak car crash deaths in 1972, which is here. We're way above that at this point. Um, and in fact, at this point, about 91 people die of a drug overdose every day. It's about uh, an overdose death every nine minutes. Um, and this is another uh, chart. That blue line that's zipping up there is fentanyl, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Um, but these are the drugs uh, and the overdose deaths. And so these are, you know, these are charts that are in the New York Times. The New York Times has done a whole series of reporting on the opioid crisis. They've been going out and interviewing people and interviewing family members and talking about them. The Washington Post has done the same thing. Um, like all of these papers have done these reports interviewing grieving parents, um, you know, talked about, you know, these are deaths of despair, right? These are, you know, these are, We've been, we've been seeing the, the, the victims of the overdose epidemic as, as, as human, as suffering human beings. This is very different from any of the coverage that we got around the crack epidemic in um, the 1980s. Our primary response to crack use in the 1980s was to crank up um, the criminal justice system, to arrest more people, to sentence them, to sentence them for longer time, to arrest their family members, to sentence their family members to longer time. Whereas our approach around the opioid crisis has been one of concern, of humanizing people, of trying to increase access to health care, of talking about treatment. Um, it's this, you know, literally this kinder, gentler uh, war on drugs. And that was actually a literal headline. Um, and so why, why, this is a you know, rhetorical question, um, why are we responding? Is it because we learned our lessons the last time around from the crack epidemic and we now know that people who use drugs are human beings and their families are suffering loss and so on? Well, no. <laughs> um, and this is where white supremacy comes into play yet again in our response to drugs and drug use. The people who are suffering and dying from opioid overdoses are perceived to be white and therefore fully human and therefore in need of compassion instead of a criminal justice response. And it's, it, you know, it's sort of horrifying to look at headlines and coverage side to side, um, which is, you know, the opioid epidemic is horrible. It is awful. People are dying in record numbers, and we are not doing enough about it. That is absolutely, completely, 100% true. Fentanyl is really freaking scary. Um, and so much of our response to this, as well as the cause of this, is because of the ways in which white privilege and white supremacy plays out, and you know the ways in which, in the United States, we tend to see white people as human and, um, and people of color as others. This falls right into, into that frame. Um, you know, when we talk about the, the sort of deaths of despair, that opioid use, overuse, misuse is uh, creating these deaths of despair, that is not actually any different than much of what was happening in, you know, in urban, um, economically suffering neighborhoods in large cities in the 1980s when people were turning to crack. It is the same uh, type of economic deprivation. There are no jobs in my community. There's no opportunity. There's nothing for me to do. Um, I have no hope. Um, that operates in a, you know, Appalachian former coal mining town that was operating in, you know, burned out urban uh, big city neighborhoods in the 1980s. And our, the fact that our response is different is, um, is pretty much, well it's, well, it's entirely, some of it is because we learned a few lessons along the way. Uh, most of it is because we continue to be a very racist country. Um, 
And you know, some of this is a photo of a needle exchange in southern Indiana. Um, this needle exchange was uh, came about a very hard way. The former governor of Indiana, Mike Pence, you may have heard of him. Um, among other things, he uh, doesn't like Planned Parenthood. He defunded all of the Planned Parenthoods in the state of Indiana. In southern Indiana, the only place that was doing HIV testing and counseling was the Planned Parenthood. So once that Planned Parenthood stopped uh, closed, there was nobody in that part of the state to do HIV testing or counseling. And it's also an area that's very economically deprived. Um, people started using opioids, started using um, uh, heroin, but mostly um, opioid pills, Opana, and um, developed the most significant HIV outbreak that we have seen in this country since essentially since the beginning of the epidemic. And um, they didn't have any needle exchange. Everyone was being arrested for drugs. And uh, they had this huge outbreak that fortunately we've been able to respond to by creating this. Um, but so what do we do now? And how do, we, how do we change any of this? How do we respond to this in a way uh, that tries to undo some of these harms? Um, oh, shopping cart. So, uh, how many of you heard about the shopping cart, the fentanyl on the shopping cart? Yeah. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about drug panics and then and then wrap up. So I'm getting to my end here. Um, so there was, I mean, so fentanyl is is scary. Uh, fentanyl is a horrifying. Um, it's poisoning our drug supply in this country, basically. What makes fentanyl so scary, it is so powerful and it acts really fast. What does not make fentanyl scary is that you can absorb it through your skin. You can't. That doesn't happen, it's not physiologically possible. In fact, you may have heard of fentanyl patches. They have to use a special technology in those patches in order for it to be absorbed in your skin, right? Um, but there was recently this thing about um, beware, you might overdose by touching the handle of your shopping cart <laughs> because there might have previously been someone shopping there who had fentanyl on their hands. Why that person didn't then spontaneously overdose, I don't know. But somehow that person didn't spontaneously overdose for this, touched the shopping cart handle, and when you, or even worse, your child touches the shopping cart handle, they will sort of spontaneously overdose. That is not true. <laughs> it can't happen. It doesn't happen. We've also heard these reports of, you know, the police officer who was responding to an overdose and touched the person and overdosed themselves. Again, doesn't happen. It's not physically possible for that to happen. And there's also this stuff around it's naloxone resistant, like naloxone won't reverse a fentanyl overdose. Naloxone will reverse a fentanyl overdose. If naloxone doesn't reverse it, it wasn't an opioid overdose, right? Naloxone is this um, uh, antidote to opioid overdose uh, that works. Um, and the, I mean, when I say that, that fentanyl is scary, it is because it works so quickly, because it is so powerful, and because people don't know that it is in their drugs. One of the ways in which, you know, the, the sort of pendulum swing of the war on drugs is swinging back is trying to introduce these drug-induced homicide laws around uh, if somebody sells or gives uh, some heroin to someone and it turns out to have fentanyl in it and they overdose and die to charge them with this drug-induced homicide. And the reality is most people don't know that there's fentanyl in their drugs. It's not as if they were intentionally doing this. Plus, what you want when someone overdoses is you want people to call 911. You want them to um, use naloxone if they have it, but to call 911 and get someone in. Um, just to sort of, you know, my uh, kind of parting words on drug panics and drug myths. Um, you know, there never were any crack babies as it turns out, um, they didn't happen. Uh, they certainly weren't this, you know, we're going to have thousands of super predators um, roaming the streets. 
uh, if there is a racist element underlying media's coverage and media panic, that's always a good sign that what you're seeing is some sort of moral racist panic and not um, an actual threat to anyone. Um, the photo on the other side, this is strawberry meth. Um, and it's a warning from a police department that um, evil drug dealers are trying to manufacture methamphetamine as a strawberry quick to give to children um, and somehow get them hooked because as we all know, children have lots of disposable income. Um, and basically anything that is targeted at children that's saying like the, we must protect our children, that is always a good uh, sign that you should be double checking this information and seeing where it comes from and thinking very critically about what the information is. Um, and uh, um, in general, sort of how to, how to read or think about these kinds of um, drug panics, whether it's cannibals or something else, um, is that law enforcement is really pretty much never a good authority on drugs, unless they're actually using drugs, in which case they're probably not a good authority for different reasons. Um, uh, not because drug use makes you unreliable, just because a law enforcement officer who is using drugs is likely to be corrupt in a number of different ways and therefore not reliable. Um, so yeah, if the only sources of information are law enforcement, that's not great. Um, if children are involved uh, and being held up as we must protect our children, that's a good uh, flag to think more critically about this. Um, and if there is some sort of big bad being, um, uh, like I'm certainly not a fan of Monsanto, I'm not a fan of big pharma and pharmaceutical companies, they've done a lot of damage in the world for their own profit, but nonetheless, if you start hearing about Monsanto is manufacturing genetically modified marijuana, that's not happening. Um, and or you're hearing, you know, pharmaceutical companies are just trying to make money off of this. It's a good sign to look more critically. Uh, Monsanto and Big Pharma are not are not good players. They're not um, uh, responsible corporations. But they often, you know, it's sort of like chemtrails. They get assigned negative things to them um, because they're seen as bad. And it's a good it's a good point to sort of think more critically about what's going on there. So um, uh, this is one of the few places in North America where it's legal to use drugs. This is a supervised consumption site in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, this is one of the solutions to this problem. Um, and uh, this is, um, oh, I meant to put those pictures in the other order. There's a lot wrong with this photo. Uh, including, and friends of mine have a collection of really horrible stock photos, but one, I, you know, I don't know what that white powdery substance is, um, but I think it's something that they got out of, you know, their mom's baking supplies, and that is not a needle that anyone uses to inject anything into their veins. Um, you use much shorter needles for that, but obviously for the shock value, they needed to have this longer one. Um, so again, these are, these are things to uh, look for um, in media coverage. Um, but yeah, so where do we go? So Insight Supervised Consumption Services, um, Portugal is an excellent model for what to do. Uh, they decriminalized personal use of drugs um, a number of years ago and have had uh, really dramatic results in terms of lowering their HIV rates, lowering their overdose rates, lowering their drug use. Um, reducing crime, uh, basically everything that you want to see can happen, um, but we have to be willing to make some pretty drastic changes in how we, uh, how we operate and what we do here. So um, that is basically it. My takeaways that I want you to have from this is that it's, you know, no drug is instantly addicting, that most of the harms related to drug use actually come from prohibition. 
um, that uh, you know racism and white supremacy underlie most of what we do and think around drugs, and it's useful to be very critical of media coverage um, of the assumptions that are made when we talk about drugs and drug use. Um, and we definitely have better models, uh, Canada and Portugal being two of them, and um, decriminalizing drugs, ending the war on drugs, uh, syringe access. And um, with that, I hope I have given you a, a guide and better understanding to what's going on with the war on drugs and ways to help undo it. So thank you. <laughs>